Welcome to John Gets Games. This is my tutorial for Gaia Project, and in this video I'll be teaching you how to play the game while we're actually playing it. Now if you'd like to watch the rest of the playthrough, you can find a link for that down below in the description, or by clicking the eye up there in the top corner. Now I would like to mention that the reason this video is being made is because it was selected by the contributing producer supporters of this channel. Now that happens over at Patreon, and if you'd like to learn more about that, you can go to patreon.com slash Games. Now, I would also like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles. That way, if I make any mistakes while we're playing through the game, I can then put corrections directly on the screen and you should be able to see them. Now, what's going on in this game is each player is in charge of an asymmetric starfaring race, and they are all competing to take over planets on a communal board. Now, players have a specific home type of planet, and if they ever want to colonize any of the other types, they will have to terraform those, which costs quite a bit of resources. Now, in order to expand out, you will have to spend resources, but as you put buildings onto the map, you will unlock more income, which gives you more resources in new rounds that you can then spend to expand out even more. Now, as players are doing this, they are also going to be going up research tracks, which give a variety of benefits, whether that be income, uh, resources immediately, or allow you to do previous things more efficiently. Now, there is a lot more going on to this game, and I will explain the details of all of it as we get there. But before we jump into it, I would like to ask that if you end up enjoying this video, you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Also, if you would like to directly support this channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to johngetsgames.com support. There you'll find a bunch of ways that you can really help things out, and some of them have cool perks like voting on a couple of the videos that I film each month. Now again, this is one of those videos, so that is why it's being made. Alright, let's now jump into the game. Out here, the game is fully set up and ready to play for our two different players. Today, we will be playing as the Brown Taclon race, and as you can see out here on the board, we already have a couple of our mine figures out there. Now, this game is going to be played over six total rounds, and within each round, there are four phases. So let's go ahead and start the first round off, and the first phase in each round is income. Now this happens simultaneously for all of the players, and you simply look to your playing area and find everything that has this little hand symbol on it, and you then take those resources or those bonuses. Now for us, we can look out here, and down at the very bottom, we have three of these symbols showing the white square. Now white squares are ore, and that is tracked up here along the top of our board. As you can see, at the start of the game we have four because of that little symbol there, so now we can take three more, which brings us up to seven. Next up, there is another income symbol right over here, and that is going to give us one technology. That is tracked with this blue hexagon, so we can move that right over here to the four. It looks like that's all of the income we have on our main player board, but players also have access to boost strips like this one, as well as technology, which might also have income symbols. In this case, we do have an income symbol, which gives us two power bumps. In order to do this, we have to come up to the top part of our board with these three power zones. Now you'll notice we have these power tokens over here, and we also have this special looking one, which is called the Brainstone. Now this is an asymmetric benefit that only the Taclon player gets, and for the purposes of charging power, it acts the same way as the rest of these tokens. So we have two power charge actions for this income, and for every one of these, we can move a power token clockwise to the next zone. So we can start by moving this brainstone right here up into the level 2 area, and it's worth noting that you cannot move anything from 2 into 3 until there is nothing left in the 1 area. So that means for our one other power up, we must take one of these two and push it into the second zone. So we are now done with our income, but our opponents, the Geodans, also get to do this simultaneously. Now, as you can see, they're going to gain three ore, so that's going to bring them from six all the way up to nine. And you may have noticed that they were at six instead of the four, and that's because they got an extra two ore as part of setup, and I'll explain why later. Next up, they gain one in knowledge, which brings them to four. And also, we can see over here, they get another knowledge from this boost strip. So that's going to bring them to five, and they get another ore, which brings them up to ten. Alright, the income phase is done, so we can now move into the second phase of the round, which is the Gaia phase. Now at this point, nobody has anything to do in this phase, and in fact, I'm going to explain the specifics of how this works later on in the tutorial. So with that in mind, let's now jump right into the third phase of the round, which is the action phase. Now the action phase is not simultaneous. Instead, the player who has this starting player pawn gets to go first. Now, on a player's turn in the action phase, they will take a single action out of these eight different options that we can see on this cheat card. Now, after a player finishes their action, play will move on to the next player clockwise around the table, and we will keep going back and forth until everyone has passed. 
Now this means we get to take the first action of the game, and I think we should build a mine. Now the way we do this is we come to the bottom part of our board, which has all five different types of buildings on it. Now at the very bottom we have the mines, and over on the left hand side this says that we have to spend two money and one ore to construct a mine. So that means we can spend an ore going down to 6, and 2 money, which brings us down to 13, and we can then take the leftmost mine and put it out onto the map. So let's now find a planet to build this mine down onto, and in order to do this we have to meet three different criteria. The first criteria is the planet must be empty, and obviously most of them are currently, so that should not be a problem. The second criteria is we have to be able to access the new planet. Now, at the start of the game, we put a mine right over here on this brown planet and another mine right up there. Now, as part of setup, you can only put uh, mines down onto planets of your home type, and as the Taclons, we are the brown race. So whenever you have to access a new planet, you're essentially going to fly from a previous planet with one of your buildings. Now, the amount of flying distance we have is shown with this navigation track over here on the research board. Now at the start of the game, you can see our pawn is right here on the bottom, and there is a little one. Now that means we have a distance of one that we can do at the start of the game, which means we can effectively go to an adjacent spot and populate that planet. This means at this point in the game, a travel distance of one just gives us access to this blue planet that's adjacent to this brown mine and that yellow planet right up here. Now that's not entirely true, because we do start the game with a quantum information cube, which is a really neat resource. Now these QICs can be used for a variety of different things, and one of those is a free action. Now if you look at the bottom right hand corner of your playing board, all of these are free actions that you can take at any point during your turn. Now up here we can see there is a QIC here, and if you get rid of one of these, you can actually give yourself plus two to your travel distance once, of course because this is then discarded. So that means we could get rid of this to get two, plus one, or three movement, but I don't think we actually need to do that at this point. Instead, let's hold on to this for now, and I think let's build this mine out onto this yellow planet right over here. Now, I did say that there are three things that we have to check first, and the third thing is, can we actually terraform that planet to become a brown planet? So we obviously have to terraform that yellow planet, and the way terraforming works is we have to come down to this area in the bottom portion of our board. Now this shows us the terraforming cost for each one of the other types of planets. Again, we have the brown planet as our home planet, so if we ever build on another brown planet, we don't have to terraform anything. So we can see right over here that a yellow or a black planet is going to cost one terraforming unit. If we were to try to build on an orange or the white planet, that would cost us two terraforming units. And if we wanted to terraform a red or blue planet, that would cost three. Now there is one more way that you can easily visualize this terraforming, and that involves the perimeter of this round track board. Now again, brown is our home planet, so you can see if we go one step over here we hit the black planet, and one step over there is the yellow. So that is why it's just one terraforming unit to go from yellow to brown. Now again, we have white and orange that are two steps away from brown, which is why that's two terraforming units. And lastly, red and blue are three steps away from brown, no matter which direction you go. So we can come back here and see that we have to terraform a yellow planet, which is going to take one terraforming unit. And in order to know how we pay for that unit, we have to come down here to this terraforming research track. Now on the right hand side, it tells you how many ore you have to spend for each terraforming unit. In this case, at the start of the game, we are right over here, and that means we have to spend three ore for that single terraforming step. Now, as you can see, as we move this token up farther on this track, we will spend less and less ore. So going up here is certainly nice, and I'll explain how to go up these steps rather soon. So we have to spend three ore in order to terraform this yellow planet, which is going to drop us down to three. Now, the last part of this action involves checking to see if any of our opponents get a passive power charging action. Now the way this works is whenever you construct within a range of two of one of your opponent's buildings, they have the option of spending victory points to get power charge actions with their three power zones. Now as you can see, we built over here, and that is one, two, three spaces away from our opponent. But let's just pretend we had built right over here instead. Now that would be within two of our opponent, and that means they would have the option of charging up with their mine. Now the way this works is they'd come down to their player board and look right over here and see that there is a single purple token within the mine spot of their board. Now what this means is they can do a single power charge action because there's a single token, and they will then lose victory points equal to 1 minus the number of power charging they got. 
So that means if this had happened, then they would get one power charge and they would get one minus one or zero loss in victory points. So obviously they would do it. Now I haven't explained why we actually want to charge this power yet, but I'll get to that soon. So let's bring this right back over here because that isn't what we did on our turn. All right, we've now finished out this build action, but before we move on, I'd like to bring your attention to these two tracks over here on the round board. Now, as you can see, at the end of each one of these is a token, and we randomly pulled these out to put them over here. Now, when the game is over, we are going to have a competition, and the player who has the most of each of these two tracks is going to get 18 points, second place will get 12, and third place will get 6. Now, this is a two-player game, and whenever you are playing a two-player game, you have these dummy tokens out here as well, and these will potentially place over here, so you have to beat your opponent, and these dummy cubes as well. Now, this track right down here is the number of different sectors that you have buildings in. So every time we construct a new mine, we have to double check and see if we have built into a new sector. At the start of the game, we are in two different sectors, which is why we are on the two slot. And when we built this, that is actually in sector one as well. So this will not go up anymore, but we have to pay attention to that in the future. Now, with regards to this top track, this is just the number of these Gaia planets that we currently have buildings on. And at this point, neither of us have any. Now, when it comes to constructing onto Gaia planets, the rules are a little bit different, but I'll explain the specifics of that soon. All right, we are now done with our turn, so our opponents, the Geodans, now get to go. And for their first action, they would like to construct a trading station. Now, whenever you build any of the non-mine buildings, you don't actually construct it immediately. You have to upgrade it from a previous type of building. Now, as you can see, these trading stations are an upgrade from a mine because you can see this kind of moves up into that area. This also means if you want to create a planetary institute or one of these research labs, you would have to replace a trading station. Lastly, these academies will replace these research labs right over here. So what that means is they are going to have to spend two of their ore, which brings them down to eight, in order to take this and replace one of their mines. Now, whenever you place buildings, you always grab from the left and move over, but you'll notice they also have to spend money. Now, it says three or six, and that depends on the proximity of this new station to one of their opponents. With that in mind, they can now come out to the board, and they do have two mines available for upgrading. Now, remember before when we built a mine, if we built it within two spaces of one of our opponents, then they would get a passive charge action. Well, that two spaces is effectively the neighborhood. And if you ever upgrade a trading station within the neighborhood of an opponent, you just spend three money instead of the six. Now, with this in mind, the orange player decides they do want that discount. Money can be a little bit hard to come by sometimes. So they are going to upgrade this area right over here because we are in the overall neighborhood. Now, as a benefit, whenever a building is upgraded or when a mine is built, then the uh, players who are in the neighborhood get to do that passive power charge. Now, again, if we decide to do this, we get power bumps equal to the number of little purple symbols underneath the building that is within that neighborhood, and we lose points equal to that number minus one. Now, obviously, that is one right now, so we don't lose any points for doing this, so I see no reason not to do this. And remember, whenever you charge, if you have anything in your one zone, you must push that into the two zone. Now that we have nothing in the one zone, we can push these into the three zone with future charge actions. And it's worth noting that you can only spend power once it's in the third zone. So we are just charging all of these up and we're not ready to use them just yet, but I hope to get there soon. So the Geodins will now spend one, two, three of their money. And of course, the mine that was just upgraded will now come back over here to their board. Now you may notice that by bringing this back, they have actually reduced their ore income by one, but they have increased their money income by three. At this point, the orange player is done constructing that trading station, but before they move on, they are going to come up here to the round track and notice over here that in the first round of the game, there is a bonus associated with building out these trading stations. Now, at the start of the game, we randomly put all of these bonus tokens out, and within each given round, we will all get victory points if we do the specific things in those specific rounds. Now, we are currently in the first round of the game, and every time any player constructs a trading station in the first round of the game, they will get three victory points. So, the orange player can take three points right now, which they will add to their starting ten, so they are now up to thirteen. Next up, let's briefly come back to this round track to see what the benefits are in the next rounds of the game. We can see in the second round of the game, everyone will get two points every time they increase one of their research tokens on the tracks. In the third round, whenever anyone constructs an academy or their planetary institute, they will get five points in that round. 
Moving on in the fourth round, for every mine that is constructed specifically on the green Gaia planets, that player will get three points. The fifth round, players will get two points for every terraforming step they uh, process. And finally, in the sixth round of the game, players will once again get five points each time they construct the Planetary Institute or an Academy. All right, the geodins are done, so now we get to go again. So we have a variety of things that we could do at this point, but I think what our second action should be is actually upgrading one of our research tokens on one of these tracks. As you can see, this will always cost four knowledge. And we happen to have four knowledge at this point, so we can drop this down to zero. The next thing we do is move one of our research tokens up once on the associated track. Now, whenever you get to a spot that has an icon with this glowing white border, you immediately get that once. Now, this is why our opponent started the game with two extra ore, because as part of their asymmetric benefit, they started with one up on the terraforming track, which gave them this two ore right here. Now, we already know a little bit about the first two tracks. Obviously, the higher we go on the terraforming track, the less ore we have to spend for each terraforming step. This navigation track is also nice because it lets us fly around to farther planets, which increases the options of spots for us to build mines onto. Now, this third track right here is the artificial intelligence track, and it's pretty simple. All you gain from this is more quantum information cubes, which are definitely nice to have. Moving on, this fourth track is called the Gaia Project, which is of course the name of the game that we're playing, and this track gives you the ability to transform the inhospitable purple planets out on the planet into the green Gaia planets. Now this next one right over here is the economy track, and it just gives you lots of income. And lastly, the science track gives you knowledge income, which of course lets you do more research bumps, which you can then use to of course bump up more of these research tokens. Well, all of these seem pretty great, but I think at this point, let's go up on the navigation track. Now, as you can see, we are unfortunately still at the one distance. We don't get to two distance until we go up once more on this track, but we are getting closer. And as a bonus, we get one QIC cube right now. So let's add that right over here and our turn is done. So the orange player gets to go, and for their turn, they've decided to do an upgrade again, but this time they are going to upgrade their trading station into their singular planetary institute. Now, as you can see, this is going to cost them six money and four of their ore. So they now have four ore left, and it looks like they have six money left. After this, they can replace one of their trading stations with their planetary institute. In this case, they currently only have one trading station, so this is their only option. Now when they do this upgrade, we can see that we are within the neighborhood of that upgrade action, so that means we get to do a passive power-up. Of course, we still have a mine, which just gives us a single power-up, so with that, let's move our brainstone down into our third power zone. After this, the orange player can put their trading station right back over here, and you'll notice that they have unveiled some new stuff for themselves. Now, underneath that planetary institute, there is now an icon here which says, as part of income, they get four power moves, and they will have this for the rest of the game. Now, also, as part of income, they actually have to gain another power. Now, that is going to come from the supply, and it will get added down into their first power zone, so that means they will get more and more of this to move around in their system. Now, there are a couple ways to remove power tokens, and I'll cover those soon. Now, in addition to these benefits, once player has built their planetary institute, they also get the benefit that is listed over on the right. Now, in this case, for the Geodins, this says for the rest of the game, whenever they colonize a new planet type, they will instantly get three knowledge. Now, again, there are effectively 10 different planet types in the game. Uh, one of them does not actually start on the board, but eight of them can be built into. And so far, the Geodins are just in one. So they are going to be trying to populate as many different types of planets, because, of course, each time they will get three knowledge, which is almost the four that they need to do a research token bump. All right, they are now done with their turn, which means it's now time for us to go. And I think let's spend this action building another mine. Now, unlike the last time we did this, I'd like to do this with the special action that is printed on our boost token. Now, whenever you see an orange outline like this to an action, that actually takes your entire turn, and you can take one of these blockers to cover it up, showing that you have now used this this round. Now, what this says is we can construct a mine, and we get plus three to the distance that we have for the accessibility of this turn. So we can put this out on the map. That is going to cost us one ore as well as two of our money. So we can come out here and we have three plus one or four movement that we can do with this build action. And I think let's start right over here and go one, two, three, four. And we can then construct on this Gaia planet. 
Now, you may have noticed that I did not describe what kind of terraforming steps it takes to build on the Gaia planets because they are special. Let's once again come down to our terraforming area, and you'll notice the green planet right here is just going to cost one of our quantum information cubes to terraform. Now, that does not matter which race we are. For every single race, it's just one QIC cube to get that terraforming done. Now, there is another way to do this with your Gaia formers, as you can see right over here, but that involves upgrading the Gaia project track, which nobody has done just yet, and I'll explain how that works soon. So, we can spend this cube to terraform the Gaia planet, and we can now see that we have a building in a new sector, and we have constructed a building on a Gaia planet. So let's come back over here to the tracks, and we can increase this over to the 3 spot because we are in 3 sectors, and we can move this one to the 1 spot because we have that one Gaia planet. So pushing both of these tracks with one action felt pretty good to me. We've also expanded ourselves out so that we are just two steps away from a brown planet that we do not have to terraform, and we are also now two steps away from a yellow planet, which is one of the easier ones for us to terraform. So that has finished out our turn, and it's now time for the Geodins to go, and they've decided to spend four knowledge to bump a research token. Now, in this case, we're not too surprised to see them push the terraforming track, considering their goal is to try and uh, build on as many different types of planets as they can. So now for the rest of the game, they only spend two ore for every terraforming step instead of the three ore that we have to do. All right, it's now our turn again, but before we take our turn, I have to correct something real quick. It looks like a couple turns ago when we went up the tracks, I pushed our opponent. And also at this point, I am going to cheat just a little bit and change what we upgraded. Uh, I said we went over here to get this cube, but instead, let's just pretend like we had gone over here to get this two ore. Uh, sorry for changing things around, but I think this is a much better plan for showing the different mechanics. And uh, with that in mind, let's now go into our turn. And I think it's time for us to upgrade into one of these trading stations. So that is going to cost us two of our ore. And we are going to build this near our opponent. So that means this is just going to cost us three of our money. And then we can put this right out here. Now, of course, as we do this, our opponent is in the neighborhood, which is why we got that discount. But they now get the option of passively charging up their power. And you can see they are doing this with their massive planetary institute. Now, when they look at their board, they can see that that Planetary Institute has three of these tokens. So that means if they do this, they would get three power charge actions, but they would lose three minus one or two victory points. Well, it looks like they've decided to do that. So they will move this up for one, then two, and finally three. And then they'll lose two points, bringing them down to 11. Next up, we did construct a trading station in the first round, so we get three points. So we'll go from 10 up to 13, and our turn is done. This means the Geodins get to go, and they want to construct a mine. And they currently have an accessibility distance of just one. So with this, they are going to construct it right over here on this red planet. Now that does mean they have to terraform the planet, and for every terraforming step, they just have to spend two of their ore. Now of course, they also have to spend an ore for the mine itself, so that means they are at three, and they spend two money. And then when they look over here, they have just one step of terraforming to get to the red planets, so that means that they will have to get rid of two ore to do the terraforming, which will bring them from three down to one. And then, since this is the first red-style planet that they have colonized, their Planetary Institute ability will activate, giving them three knowledge, which will bring them from one all the way up to four. They are now done, so now we get to go, and I think it's time for us to construct our first research lab. Now, as you can see, these are going to be upgraded from our trading stations, and this is going to cost us five money and three ore. Now, at this point, you might be saying, wait a minute, you only have two ore, and I think it's finally time for us to talk about these other special actions down here that can use our power. Now, as I've said before, you can only use power when it's in the third zone right over here. Now, if we look down here to the free actions, this tells us how many power we have to spend from the third zone down into the first zone in order to get the associated benefits. For instance, we could spend four power in order to get one quantum information cube. We can also spend that QIC to get one ore. Now, over here, we can see that three power moves will get us one ore. Four power moves will get us a knowledge, and we can also always spend knowledge to get one money. Now we could spend just one power in order to get a money, so that's a much easier conversion rate. And we can also spend ore into money, but that would be pretty painful. Lastly, we can spend one ore in order to add another power token into the one zone here on our board. 
so we need just one more ore, and if we look down here, that is going to cost us three power. Now, fortunately for us, we are the Taclons, and you'll notice right over here that our Brainstone counts as if it was three power for the purposes of spending. So that means we can move this right over here, and that will give us three power, and we can spend that three power giving ourselves the one ore, and now, since those were free actions, we can do the main action for the turn, where we construct this research lab, which will cost us all three of our ore, and five of our money, which brings us down to three. So we can now replace a trading station with this research lab, and our only option is right over here. So after we do that, we can see that our opponent could potentially do a passive power charge action if they want. And it looks like they have decided to once again do that. So that is going to be three for their Planetary Institute, which lets them go one, two, three. And of course, they will then lose two victory points, bringing them down to nine. Let's now come back to our board and finish our turn, because we get a special benefit every time we construct either a research lab or one of these academies, and that involves taking a technology. You can see the silhouette is right over there, so what that means is we can take any one technology from the research board and add it into our area. So let's come back over here, and the technologies are these nine ones listed down at the bottom of the board. Now it's worth noting that every time you play the game, you randomly associate these technologies with the different spots. You always use all nine, you just don't know where they'll end up being. Now within each stack, you always have the same technology, and whenever you select a technology, if it's one of the top six, then you will immediately bump your research token once on the associated track. Now if instead you choose one of the three that are randomly put down here at the start of the game, you can take any of your research tokens and move it up. So uh, that means we could just take this one and immediately take seven points and bump any of these tokens. Now at this point, I think this is an amazing technology for us because it means once per round we get four power moves and when we move our brainstone around we get a lot of benefit for that. So let's take this, which means we get to bump this research token up here, and now we have one more knowledge income. Before we move on, I also want to mention that no player can ever have two of the same technology, so this is the only one of these that we will get this game. So let's add this right over here, and that has finished out our turn. So the Geodens now get to go again, and it looks like they do have four knowledge, so they are going to spend all of that to boost another one of their research tokens. Now they certainly have a bunch of good options. If they increased this one right up here, they would immediately get three power bumps one time, and then for the rest of the game, they would just spend a single ore for every terraforming step. Next up over here, they do like the idea of flying faster, and having more of these QICs is obviously good for flying far and also building on the Gaia planets. Now at this point, they are definitely considering going up on the Gaia project track, and in fact, I think let's talk a little bit more about how this works. Now we can see at the first step, there is this benefit, which gives the player a single Gaia former. Now you can see each player has up to three of them, so when you unlock one, you bring it right over here and put it onto your board. Now as a new action option for the rest of the game, you can take an available Gaia former and put it out onto the board, but specifically they go onto the purple transdim planets. Now when you send a Gaia Former out, you have to of course be able to access it, so at this point the orange player would hypothetically just put it right over here because that's just one space away. Now you do have to pay in order to put this down, but it's going to cost you power tokens. Now in order to know how many you have to pay, you have to come back to the Gaia Project track. At this first level right over here, you have to spend six, and then up here that would cost four, and lastly that one would cost three. Now when you spend power for Gaia Forming, it works differently than normal. Instead of taking the power from the third area and moving it into the first, you can take the power tokens from any one of these three zones and you put them all over here into the Gaia forming spot. Now as part of the following round during the Gaia phase, which happens right before the actions, all of these tokens will follow this arrow down here into the first zone. So that means right now they could spend all four of these as well as these two right over here to do that hypothetical action. Of course, they haven't done this just yet. I'm just describing how it works. So as you can see, that is one way to utilize your power even if it's not in the third zone. So that is everything you would do for this action. But then in the next round, once we got to the second phase, which is the Gaia phase, in addition to having all of your power tokens come back into your one area, you will then take one of these Gaia planet tokens and you will put this underneath the Gaia former because it has successfully terraformed that planet. Now I do want to stress that these Gaia formers will only ever turn the specific purple transdim planets into the green Gaia planets. 
Now, once this transformation has been complete, the guy former will actually stay on there. And in a future action turn, that player can then build a mine on that planet and they can build it as if it was their uh, regular uh, home base type of planet. There is no terraforming needed because players obviously can always go down onto guy planets. In fact, you don't even have to pay the QIC when you uh, build a mine onto a planet that has one of your Gaia farmers. So obviously, the Gaia Project track is a great way to increase the number of colonization options out there on the board. Now, in this instance, it looks like our opponent has decided they'd actually like to just go right up here. That is going to increase their income by two money and a single one of the power moves, and they like the idea of having that going into the next round. All right, it's now time for us to go, and we don't have much in the way of resources. Specifically, we just have three money total. Now, instead of spending resources, I think this turn, let's spend it taking one of these tokens, and we can cover up our technology, and that will give us four power charge actions. So we can spend the first one bringing our brainstone right up here into the second area, and with the other three, we can bring this here, and then there, and there. So that was a very effective way to get this brainstone back into action so that we can use it again this round. So it looks like we have five power available to spend with these free actions if we want to, but for the moment I'm going to not do that, so now our opponent can go. Well, just like us, they are definitely running out of resources, but at this point, they have decided they would like to take one of these actions that are printed along the bottom part of the research board. Now, as you can see, all of these right over here are going to cost power, but these are not free actions. They will cost the entire player's turn. So what they've decided to do is activate this one right here, and that is going to cost them four power. So they do have four power in their active third area, so they can bring all of this over here, and then that will give them two ore, which brings them up to three. Now after that, you actually cover this up, so that has now blocked that action option for all players for the rest of the round. Now while we are talking about these, let's look at some of these other options. You can see that you can spend all the way up to seven power to get three knowledge, and you can spend five power in order to actually generate two terraforming steps. And when you do this action, you will do it as you actually put a mine down onto the board. Now you can do that to a lesser extent over here by getting a single terraform step, and you can also just spend three power right here to get two more power tokens. Now over here, these three sections are a little bit different. They are going to cost the quantum information cubes, and this one right here costs four. Now if you spend the four, then you will block this spot right off, and you can immediately take one of these technologies just as if you had just built a research lab or an academy. So this is obviously an expensive but very powerful action. Next up, this spot is going to cost three QICs, and when you cover this up, you will immediately reactivate a federation token. Now, I haven't talked about these just yet, but they look a lot like this. So if you already had this in your area, then you could go right here, spend three cubes, and get eight more points and another cube. Now, I'll talk about these in greater detail very soon, but we can now move on to this last option, which just gives you three points plus one point for every type of planet that you have colonized, and you get those points by spending two QICs. All right, it's now time for us to go again, and we don't have any resources, but we do have five power over here, so I figure let's activate one of those options on the research board. Now we can see that the one that we really wanted is already gone because this is a really good way to get ore, and if we spent five, we could immediately help terraform a planet with this action. Now unfortunately, we do not actually have the ore to create a mine at this point, so I don't think this is a good option for us. Instead, I think let's go right over here and take seven money for four power moves. Now, we can tell right now that our money income is not very high, so I think getting more money to spend next round is probably going to be a good idea for us. So that cost four power moves, and we can do that with the brainstone and a single one of these, and that has finished out our turn. Next up, the geodons can go, and they have decided to pass for the rest of this action round. Now, passing is an action in and of itself, and the way this works is the passing player will come up here and select one of these three optional boost tiles. In this case, the Geodens decided to select this one right here, and that is going to increase their income by two money in the next round, and it also gives them the ability to instantly do one terraform step when they are building a mine. Now, whenever you are passing, you select one of these, and you flip it over and put it into your area, and this helps show to all of the players that that person is done and will take no more actions. After that, the player will take their current boost strip and put it right back here into the supply. Lastly, the first player to pass in each round will take this token, so they will be the starting player in the next round. 
So it's now time for us to go again, and I think we are likely going to pass, but before we do that, I want to describe one option that we do have on this turn, and that involves this last free action that's printed over here in between our level 2 and 3 zones in the power area. Now what this is, is an action that lets you take a token from the second zone, and you can push it into the third zone, even if there are tokens in the first zone. Now as a penalty, you also have to take another token specifically from the second zone, and you discard it, so you lose it. So what that means is, if we wanted to right now, we can move two of these over here and discard these two and lose them uh, until we potentially find new ways to get more. And that would give us three power, which would let us do potentially one of the actions over there on the main board, but I don't think that's actually going to be worth it. So let's just leave all of this over here and now take the passing action. So we can choose one of these three strips and all of them have pretty good options on them. This is pretty simple. It gives two money and one QIC as part of the next round's income. And this one right here gives one ore as income, but then it has a special action up here. Now this is a passing action, and what that means is, on the next round, if we took this, as we brought this back over here when we passed at the end of that round, we would immediately get one point for every mine that we currently have out on the board. So it does not help with our engine, but it's certainly a nice way to get some more points. Lastly, this one gives an ore and a knowledge, and I think this is the one that we want. So we can take this and flip it over into our area, and then of course take the previous one we had and add it right over here. So we can put this right over there, and I just realized that we forgot to take our 7 money last round when we did that power action. So technically, we should be up at 10. Now with that, we have finished out this action, and everyone has passed, so that means the action phase is done for this first round of the game, and we can now move into the fourth and final phase, which is cleanup. The way this works is we discard all of these blocking tokens from the main board as well as our playing areas, and then everyone will flip over their boost tokens. So this is once again available for us this round, and we also have this. And then we can signify the end of this round by removing the bonus token for it. So that means it's now time to go into the second round of the game, where players will get a bonus 2 points every time they increase a research token this round. At this point, we could now start the second round of the game, but I think I will actually save that for the extended playthrough. Now before we wrap this tutorial up, there are a couple more things that I want to cover, and the first one of these is the Federate action. Now the way this works is a player can create a federation once they have 7 power worth of buildings adjacent to each other out on the main board. Now again, each building has a power level, the mines have 1, these trading stations have 2 as well as the research labs, and the academies and planetary institutes have 3. Now you may be wondering how you would ever get to 7 power worth of buildings adjacent to each other considering most planets are not actually touching. Well that is where these satellite cubes come into play. Now as part of this federation action, you can discard one of your power from any one of your zones in order to place a single satellite down into any one of the empty spaces on the board. So in this case, if we spent three of our tokens from any of these bowls, we could put a satellite there and then two more here, and these two buildings are now effectively adjacent for the purpose of federation. Now obviously this is just two power and this is one, so that's three power total and we need to get to seven, and you are not allowed to place satellites out until you can get to that seven threshold. Now it is worth noting that multiple players can have satellites in the same area, so there is no race when it comes to putting these out onto the board. So let's pretend we had these out here, so now that is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 power worth of buildings. So that means we could put these satellites out, but you must put them out as efficiently as possible. Now you are allowed to choose which planets you want to select for this. You could select a building way over here if you wanted to spend all of that power to put the satellites out onto the board. Now in this case, obviously, if we federated, we would have to put them just like this, because that would be the most efficient way to connect all of these up. So, in this example, we just placed four satellites, so that means we would have to discard four of these power tokens from any one of the zones. After this, we take a federation token, and we put it out next to any one of the buildings in this federation. Now that is important, because no building can ever be a part of a new federation, so this is going to show that all of these buildings are locked out, and if we want to make any future federations, we have to do it with an entirely different cluster of buildings. Now the last thing you do for a federation action is take any one of these available federation tokens and immediately get the benefits listed on it. So we could take this one and get 7 points as well as 2 ore. We would then put this face up into our area, and that is important because you may have noticed that most of these have a green background, but this bottom one right here is grey. 
Now that just gives you 12 points and the backside is also gray, but the reverse of all of these green ones is gray. Now you can actually spend these Federation tokens by flipping them over in order to unlock the ability to get to the top level over here on these research tracks. You can see that symbol right there. So that means if the orange player wanted to go from here to here, they would have to already have a Federation. They would have to have a token on the green side and then flip it over to make that happen. Now you can also flip this over in order to take one of these specialized technology tiles. Now you can only take these tiles if you have your research token on the four or the five spot adjacent to it. And when you take this, you once again have to exhaust one of your Federation tokens. After that, you will take this and you have to actually cover up one of your previous technologies. You can see it fits nicely right over there. That will erase your previous ability and give you a new one for the rest of the game. At this point, the last thing that I'd like to cover is endgame final scoring. Now, once we go through six full rounds in the game, we will go to final scoring, and players will already have a decent amount of points, hopefully. And in addition to those points, they will get points for being first, second, or third here on these majority tracks. And they will also get four points for each step above the second level on these tracks they're at. That means if this token is here, that is worth four points. If it's right here, that is worth four plus four or eight points. And if it makes it up here, then that's four plus four plus four or 12 points for getting to the five spot on any one of these tracks. Now, the last thing that you get points for is you will add up all of your excess money, uh, knowledge, as well as ore, and you will get one point for every three of those. Once you add up all of those points, the player with the most will be the winner. So at this point, I am now going to bring the tutorial to a close. There are a couple small things that I've not quite covered just yet, but I'm sure I will bump into them in the extended playthrough. And if you'd like to watch that, you can find a link for it down below in the description, or you can click the eye up there in the top corner. And I hope you've enjoyed learning how to play Gaia Project. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including all of these producer-level Patreon backers. If you too would like to directly support the channel and the creation of videos like this one, then please go to johngetsgames.com support to see a variety of ways with which you could do that. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button down below as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.